My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. For more than two weeks now, the world has watched in horror and dismay as Russia invaded Ukraine. Images haunt us as we see young children walking alone across the Ukrainian-Polish border with tears streaming down their eyes. Or women and men scrambling for coverage as missiles and bombs fall from the sky around them. These are images we've seen far too often in recent years. Iraq, Syria, Iran are among the endless list of countries that have suffered from the plague of war and left millions homeless and dead. Yet something about this war, the Russian war on Ukraine, unsettles us. Unlike the many places where we've seen war in recent years, Ukraine was a country of relative stability, a modern Western country, determined to be the country it has longed to be after nearly 900 years of occupation by foreign lands. However, in an instant, the dreams of generations of women and men were shattered by missile attacks in the dark of night. As the initial clouds of battle Battle smoke cleared, a solitary voice pleaded with countries of the world for peace and help. Well, at the same time, that same voice comforted the people of Ukraine in their darkest hour. With the calm and steady presence, the president of Ukraine spoke and told the world that although weak, Ukraine was strong. The president's demeanor and open and honest communication became an instant beacon of hope, and not just for Ukrainians, but also for the world. It was a perfect case study of a good leader, a leader who could candidly speak of his and his country's weakness, while at the same time demonstrate an untiring commitment to and love for his people. Weakness. We are not accustomed to leaders who admit their faults and weakness. Even rarer is it for us to hear leaders apologize and turn away from their former ways. Rather, we are told that to be powerful and mighty, we must hide our weaknesses and never be vulnerable with those we lead. It is no wonder, then, why some leaders hardly ever retract from their erroneous positions or admit their wrongdoings. Instead, most leaders double down on their original plans, even when the rest of the world is telling them to do otherwise. Obstinance and pride take over their hearts, further wounding their own people and those of other lands. This is not a new story. We read in Exodus of how Pharaoh could never turn his heart and be merciful with the Hebrew people. Instead, he became more obstinate and bullheaded and risked the lives of his own people for the sake of his own pride. Even some of Israel's greatest kings fell to this trap. Just consider how Saul became wicked and lost compassion for his own people and turn from the God who saved he and his people. World history is marked by a long list of power-hungry rulers whose, whose pride got the very best of them and led to the suffering of many. What we see happening today with one leader is but another chapter in the long list of emperors, rulers, and dictators consumed with their own power and wealth, all at the expense of innocent blood. Now, lest you think I've gone all political here, 
I set before you these examples as a way to illustrate the central theme and point of today's gospel story. Although Jesus, the very Son of God, could have ruled the world of his day with power and might, he does not. He was most certainly tempted to do so, as we heard last week, as the devil tried to lure him into the trap of pride. Or even in today's reading, when confronted with the news that Herod wanted him dead, Jesus lashes out and says to the Pharisees, Go and tell that fox. Jesus seems ready to go to war. Go and tell that fox. In those days, those would have been fighting words. <laughs> Instead, he retreats and does something most extraordinary. He becomes vulnerable and opens his heart. Oh, how I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, and you were not willing. Listen to those words. Oh, how I desired. You feel the passion, the agony in this moment. Quoting from Isaiah, Jesus speaks as a mother who loses her young, but who's young, who loves her young, but whose young wants nothing to do with her. God all powerful, God almighty, becomes the God whose heart is filled with deep grief and heavy pain. She weeps and mourns wounded and rejected by the very children she loves. The one who moments earlier wanted to charge into Herod's palace becomes the one who shares his deepest griefs and sorrows with those he loves. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how can you turn away from the one who loves you? It is in this moment that Jesus' true power is revealed. As the opening prayer says today, ever so ironically, this is the moment of Jesus' majesty before taking upon the wood of the cross. If we wish to see what true power is, then we must turn and observe the scene and see Jesus reveal the glory of God, a vulnerable God, a God who so deeply loves and cares for us that she would weep for her young who turn away from her love. Think about that. A God who so loves you that this God would weep the moment we turn away from her love. The tragedy of the story is that God, through Jesus, yearns to draw all of us to God's self, to God's heart. God loves each and every one of us so much that God renounces God's power and might to make God's love for us, present for us. God becomes vulnerable and offers us the freedom to respond to God's offer of love. So will you say yes? and respond. Honestly speaking, I think many of us are unsure as to how we are to respond to God's love. I suspect that the people of Jesus' day truly wanted to share in the life that he offered them. Yet to do so, they had to give something up. They had to let go of themselves, all their worries and concerns, and simply entrust themselves to the ever-loving hands of God. This is perhaps easier said than done. It's terrifying to let go of control and to admit that we are vulnerable and not in control of our lives. If we do, we open ourselves up to all kinds of possibilities. And life can become unpredictable. That is a terrifying perspective for many of us. We don't want to lose control. 
We want to deceive ourselves into thinking we are more than what we truly are. But this is precisely what we must do. If we wish to love God, we have to first admit that we are vulnerable and in need of God's love and grace. Andre Luf, a Trappist monk, points to this in a sermon of his. He writes, Faith, after all, amounts to loving surrender, the firm confidence of one who knows himself or herself beloved. But it is above all, as in the case of Jesus, power in extreme weakness. It is not the person who knows and is able to do things, who judges and condemns, who practices faith, by believing, a human being yields and surrenders, lowers his arms, and drops his weapons. With his whole body and of all of his possessions, he delivers himself up to love. You surrender yourself to God's love. Amen.